is ethical advertising an oxymoron? I guess um, let's start at the end with you, John. I don't. I mean, I think the short answer is no. Of course, it's, it's not inherently unethical. I think uh, it's a neutral idea. It just depends on how it's practiced. Uh, but there are, there are different, to me, there are different areas of ethics you'd want to go into. There's, there's different really key questions. Uh, is, is advertising itself, is the idea of coercing people, is the idea of attempting to persuade people to do something which they otherwise might not do, is that ethical? That would be question one for me. The second question would be, is the approach ethical? Once you've decided to advertise, is the approach itself, is the, de is the delivery mechanism that you choose uh, ethical? I actually do believe that there are si some types of advertising that are, by their very nature, slightly more and less ethical than others. Um, and then the third question for me is, uh, is, is, the, is, is the product ethical? Which puts you into, into all kinds of situations, for example, uh, tough situations. The, there are many examples where you might argue that the advertising itself is, is completely ethical, but if you're advertising an unethical product, what position does that put you in? And I guess the most obvious one, just to give you a quick example, would be bottled water. Bottled water, probably something we don't talk about much, but one of the, the least ethical products on the market, uh, a product that is bad for the environment, bad in, in most ways. Uh, yet, you know, it's a very dominant product, gets a lot of advertising. And I, I noticed, in fact, last week there's another, an, another uh, I think it's a Melbourne company that's uh, launched a, a, a positive bottled water, which is, you know, if you, if you buy this bottled water, you're going to be contributing to kids in, Af in Africa getting water, which is all very sweet, but it's still bottled water. Mm. Cordelia, as an ethicist, how ethical is advertising? Well, I'd agree with John that there's nothing inherently unethical about advertising, so there's nothing intrinsically wrong with advertisers paying to communicate information about their products and services uh, to people, and it's useful for people to have that information. I would say, again, it depends on, uh, of course, advertising can be unethical, and that depends on a number of factors, including, as John says, the product, so is it a potentially harmful product either to people or to the environment? Is it... Um, the, the, the method that the advertising is... <laughs> the, That's the, way, <laughs> the, the medium, so who, who will see the advert? Is, there a, is it voluntary, whether the advert is seen or not? Uh, how is the message conveyed? So is it transparently advertising, or is it sort of... Uh, is, it, uh, is disclosure sort of... That, that is a marketing message somehow obscured? Uh, also issues of, you know, beyond the message, you know, the, you know, the, the main message which is by the product, is it sending some other sort of meta message that's somehow harmful? And also who are you targeting? Is, is, is your target group a fair, a fair target for, for advertising um, efforts? And I think really all these issues, you know, there are all sorts of lines you can cross and how, depending on the product and the message and the target and so on, that can change where the line is for all the other things. And I think they really boil down to questions of, whether your, your advertising somehow undermines people or t or t people's autonomy, so the extent to which they're able to bring their behaviour in line with their own values and judgments, and, and in general live their lives according to their own values, so they're not being sort of unduly distorted by advertising's influence in, in general. And second, is advertising either individually or collectively contributing to some sort of social or psychological or moral pollution of the environment? I think lots of the ethical issues about advertising really boil down to these two questions. Oh, well, we've heard from the onlookers. How about a practitioner, Emma? <laughs> I'm so glad you both said no, that it's not, because I thought I was going to get lynched tonight. Um, as a creative, when I was thinking about this question, it, it's not something I think about a lot, um, in, in that I think it's an internalised thing. Um, I think you come to work in an agency with a set of moral principles, which you, know, you get from growing up, from your parents, from your friends. You, you're brought into an agency which has its own set of moral principles and then you work on brands which also have their own set of moral principles. So I, the way I would look at it is if, if what you're doing is work that's legal and decent and socially responsible and truthful, then yes, absolutely, advertising is ethical. And there are cases, obviously, where that is breached. Um, but, you know, feeling like I'm defending the industry a bit, we ha I mean, we are under so much pressure to be truthful. Um, to our clients, to our brands, even internally, to your executive creative director, to your strategy planners, to your suits, um, to the cons and ultimately to the consumer. Brands live and, di live and die by their integrity and their honesty. So you're in absolutely um, no position to lie or be dishonest. It's only going to come back to bite you. Emma, when, when will 
an ethical conversation? You say it's not something that intrudes every day. No. When will those conversations happen in an agency? I'd, well, personally, I think they only happen when, when something's breached. Um, I was saying at the back, I mean, I don't know if I'm just a dag, but in 18 years in advertising, I've never had an ad taken off air. I've had complaints, but not that have been upheld. And I think Cleminger is a, is a great example of an agency. Ben was, I think, going to ask what's an example of ethical advertising. I'd say our real, actually, because <laughs> I think, as I said, you know, we've got brands to be honest to, consumers to be honest to, and I think an ethical conversation will come up when an agency breaches that trust. I have to point out, I, I have had an ad pulled. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, you, you're talking about being um, uh, sort of uh, in, in check by, by the brands, by the agency. Uh, there's also, the, the industry itself is very tightly sort of self-regulated. Um, mm. Do you get that, um, you know, everything's got to sort of go through a process through the government as well? Do you, does that intrude on your, on your thinking very often? Um, in, in my experience, especially on alcohol, um, I think in everything else, again, you put a sensibility to what you create and a, a moral, I guess, code. Um, definitely to alcohol. There are so many rules in alcohol advertising. Um, can't show that alcohol creates sexual success, popularity, intelligence. Can't drink near water. Can't ride a bike with beer on it. Can't drive. Can't play sport. I mean, it is... It's, there's a really, really narrow path to tread. And on top of that, we were saying before, beer advertising at the moment is one of the most competitive uh, um, uh, group of clients, I think, for Australia. And we're all trying to do the best beer ads we can. So uh, creativity, I think, is very much... Um, you're almost forced down a path that's very narrow, I think. They yeah. get weirder and weirder, beer, ad, beer ads, because they've got nowhere to go. There are so many restrictions. Yeah. There was a great story of a... a a Tui's new ad from a couple of years ago with, uh, I don't know if you remember the one, that it, it had people catapulting things into the sky, attempting to bring rain. Uh, and there was an extremely dubious moment in it where they catapulted what appeared to be virgins into the sky. Uh, but beyond that, the next bit was when they catapulted a stag, the emblem of the Tui's new company, into the sky. That ad was actually banned. And it was banned for the stag moment, not for the virgin moment. Uh, it, it was, it, well, to be fair, what it was really banned for was they decided that the, when, what they eventually got the clouds to do was rain beer, and everybody ran around in a beer rain celebrating. Banned because that celebrated excessive consumption, that, to have that much beer. So there's, there's all these incredibly tight restrictions uh, around beer ads. And sometimes, um, look, I'm, I must admit to a fairly libertarian streak at my core, and sometimes I do wonder if uh, we don't over-regulate uh, some of these areas. I mean, I, I, it's not my personal view, but I mean, Russell Howcroft, who's one of the regulars on the Green Transfer, pretty much has the view of tobacco advertising that, damn it, it's a legal product. If they want to ban it, let them ban it. If they want to have it legal, let us advertise it. And I don't think the world is quite that simple, but I do think he has a, something of a point that needs to be talked about. Cordelia, do you, do you think the restrictions are uh, justified and, and tight enough? Well, look, I think it's always important to bear in mind that we are talking about advertising here commercial speech rather than political speech or free speech so you know I, I think there's probably always going to be a tendency to want to uh, you know err on the side of caution rather than you know in terms of what will bring better more or cause least harm to community and people rather than you know least ha least harm to profit commercial profits and look I don't know enough mu very much about sort of for example alcohol advertising for example but I would say in, in relation to for example uh, the treatment of sex and nudity in advertising, I would say that uh, if you look, up, look on paper at the self-regulation guides of the advertising standard boards, they look fabulous. But I think in practice, uh, there, are real, there are real issues because the advertising standards board is basically deciding, well, okay, we're going to determine what community standards are. But for example, they, they published a report recently looking at those and what they found was that, and they looked at about, a, I don't know, a dozen, dozen or so uh, ads for which there are complaints made in relation to the portrayal of sex and nudity, for example. So they saw themselves as being in line with community standards because, you know, the two most offensive ads had the, the complaints had been upheld, so the ads were, were, were withdrawn. But for the ones where the ads were dismissed, looking at the, the population as a whole, and bear in mind, this is, sorry, this is not the population who had complained, but just a broad cross-section cross of the community, uh, one in three found them 
sort of objectionable. And when you looked amongst women, and of course these were all ads portraying women in sort of demeaning ways, uh, as, as many as half or more found them objectionable. So you've, you've basically got the Advertising Standards Board saying it's in line with community standards to offend half of the female population. Um, and t to me that raises some you know, some pretty important ethical questions. Um, you know, the advertising standard, yes, it's self-regulating, but there are a lot of ads out there that a lot of people find offensive. Well, self-regulation will always be a preemptive strike. I mean, self-regulation is always, at, the, at its heart, an industry trying to get in and say, look, we're being really good, before the government puts in an, out, an, 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 an external body that is going to be a probably much more draconian. It is always an attempt to uh, cut the thing off at the pass before it gets any worse. And so, it, but uh, and I, I completely agree with what you, you had to say there. You, a lot of times things, things that are kind of more commercially wrong will get picked up by trade practices. But beyond that, there is the problem that the Ad Standards Board doesn't necessarily match uh, match community standards. But it's also true that neither does the Film and Classification Office. They have the same problem a lot of the time in actually matching people. I think the interest, one of the interesting um, ethical things, particularly if it comes to things like sexualisation, one of the things I always go back to is, is and you go back to the, the brand rather than the actual advertising of it. It's, we did this in the very first episode of the TV show and I'm still fascinated by this, and it is the distance between the Dove campaign for real beauty, which is one of the most successful uh, campaigns of recent times, uh, and a very pro women message, a very positive, supposedly um, fairly feminist message, coming from precisely the same company, Unilever, which gives us Lynx. Mm. Now, Lynx is arguably the most sexist brand on television. Mm. And that company gives us two uh, completely radically different views, uh, Unilever. Emma, you would be in that, you would have come across these, these companies, work with the big companies like Unilever and Procter & Gamble. How is that meant to work? I mean, as a community, are we meant to believe one of those? Are we meant to just go, oh, they're both marketing strategies? No, so it really actually comes to, that was exactly the example I thought of when you were talking about brands needing to be ethical and in integrity. I mean, here you have Dove, mm. you, know, it's, you know, it's very, it's a, they're not, it's just a marketing ploy, their concern for women, which is clear from the fact that their parent company, Unilever, you know, is... Uh, yeah. holds completely, obviously, a whole different philosophy on, uh, you know, how to portray women. I, so, I, I, yeah, oh, look, I mean, it's hard for me to comment in that I don't know how that sort of company operates, but I would imagine that they both have very separate marketing departments. They could even be in different countries. They could be in different states of the US or wherever they're based. So I think their strategies would be very different. Um, it's sort of similar to the fact that we have a lot of Foster's brands as an agency, but we also did, we don't anymore, we did drink-wise. So there was that sort of conundrum there as well. But I think probably what Unilever are doing, I think as separate, separate entities, are talking to two very different groups of people. Should you we could, um, explain what drink-wise is, Emma? That's, uh, uh, yeah, drink-wise is a, a council that's been developed to encourage um, responsible drinking. And you can see on the bottom of all um, advertising, alcohol advertising, that it will say drink responsibly with a thumbs up. Um, and yeah. is it, is that, that's a self-regulatory um, sort of, uh, 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 what would you call it? A requirement. A, yeah. Well, it's a, requi is it, it's a legal requirement yeah. to, to have yeah. that? So that's a government-based initiative that, that uh, did they pay for the ads? Yeah. Or was it by the industry itself? Um, I can't, I do think, um, I know APPS, which is the board that regulates or pre-vets alcohol advertising, is funded and run by the different breweries and spirits companies. So there is a, there's a moral responsibility there from them to make sure that the ads that they're all putting out there are, um, are ethically correct. So yeah, look, I, I understand what's going on there, but I guess I can also see that, yeah, there, there would be two very different um, groups of people who run those brands with two very different ideas about what they're trying to do. You can't imagine it's the same people approving the uh, Lynx ads and the, and the Dove ads. Why not? If, if, it's, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if it's just part of marketing to appear that you care about women, yeah. then why, it's completely consistent that the same person could approve the, uh, let's have Lynx brand and we're going to market that to you know, 20 to 15 to 30 year olds and we're going to have yep. this brand that we market to you know, feminists. 
who work at you know the Centre for Value Agency and Ethics, you know, until they realise what's going on. <laughs> and um, yeah, but it's just cynical. It's not ethics. It's just marketing. What I, what I did hear was that um, internally, when they presented the Dove idea to the senior brand manager at Dove, who was a man, that the ad of the girl being retouched within 60 seconds, he said, I don't get it. <laughs> and apparently the brand team said to him, this is what women have to go through you know, their whole lives, which is this pressure to look better, look better. And he's like, yeah. And they said to him, um, imagine if you were told your penis was too small every day. <laughs> and then he approved it. <laughs> well, I actually in the end have more trouble with... Um uh, a brand that pretends to behave ethically than, yeah. one, than one that doesn't. I, I, I'm, I'm not fond of Dove, and I'm, I'm, I'm not fond of Dove for the reason that not only did they do that campaign, but they, you know what, when they're doing that campaign about, you know, we're the anti-beauty company, beauty company, well, they, they're not. They're actually, <laughs> they were upping the range of beauty products they had at the time. They're doing, they're, they're, they're doing deals with the Victorian government, uh, you know, which they did in 2006 or 07, to be doing self-esteem workshops for girls in high schools. Now, I don't, I've got a teenage daughter. Frankly, I don't want my teenage daughter given a self-esteem workshop by a beauty company. Uh, and I, so, and that's, not the ad, that's not advertising. Let's be, let's be clear about that. That is actually the, the brand itself. That is the marketing department. Well, while we're talking about marketing departments, I mean, we're, we're here to talk about advertising, but I guess there's no advertising without the people that, that uh, have the product to sell. Uh, Emma, I'm, I'm curious, do, uh, are you, do you pull up your clients on, on things that are unethical? Where, where does the line there? I mean, is, is advertising more ethical than, than marketing in, in that way, if we're going to sort of draw the line between the two? Um, it, in my experience, I've never had to. But, yeah, I guess, as I said before, I think the agency is, is as ethical as the brands that it represents. So um, one example I was actually thinking of something I find incredibly unethical, and it's a bit of a girly um, example, is mascara. <laughs> and I don't know if you know about the Rimmel case, which was, I think, early this year, where they finally pulled up Rimmel for... They've created a product which gives you 70% longer lashes, and they used a photo of Kate Moss, which um, they denied in the beginning was retouched, but it was clearly either she had fake eyelashes or it, it had been retouched, and that was the catalyst now for makeup companies having to run disclaimers to say that the actual product had been retouched. So, you know, I think I could say that's the kind of situation where I would get that brief and say, but hang on, this isn't actually true. So it hasn't happened to me, but I think in that, in that case, that's where a creative has to go, but hang on, you're asking me to say something which isn't true. So, which my, or do, a product doesn't do that. My experience, which is limited, is that I've, I've seen a few of those stories where client side, the brands themselves actually are quite gung-ho about ideas that you just think, no, hang on, come on, that's just not right. And um, it is hard in some ways to, and Cordelia will no doubt actually radically disagree with this one, but sometimes <laughs> I think it might be really hard to ask capitalism to have ethics. Capitalism's a pretty brutal kind of beast. Brands want to sell shit to us. That's what they're there for. But I was, I was at a great marketing conference last year, and there was a Lion Nathan marketing guy, you know, behind, I think it was Lion, behind all these... Uh, uh, booze companies, and one of the things he told me was uh, that they had 35, I think it was for Jim Beam, they had 35% female uh, buyers, but they would never admit that in ads, um, and, which I kind of like. But the great moment of the conference was uh, they were talking about a case study about this group of uh, young uh, women who uh, dance in bikinis at motor racing events. This is what they do. This is part of their big marketing strategy. They, they, they tour them around the motor, motor racing events. They dance in bikinis. If you're lucky enough, you might get to go back to the bus that they bring with them, the incredibly tricked out pimp my bus thing, and get in the jacuzzi that's in the bus with these girls. And I actually stuck my hand up at the end, and there are all lots of video and stuff, and I stuck my hand up at the end and naively said, can I just ask you, at any stage of the discussion of this particular case study, of the derivation when you were working through it, did anyone ever say, is, could this be a sexist idea? And it was like I'd spoken Swahili. <laughs> it was just one of those moments where the oxygen sucked out, they looked at me, and then they pretended I hadn't asked a question and went on. So I think I personally believe, again, it's my limited experience, I personally believe there are, there are ethical and there are unethical people in every business. Yeah. There are ethical and unethical people in advertising. But uh, I do wonder how much um, 
uh, how much uh, there are, how much more it is on the brand side, or more or less it is on the brand side, or on the agency side of it. I suspect there's slightly more on the on the brand side because they've got more to win. Cordelia, did you want to uh, wildly disagree with John on? on <laughs> um, can, look, can capitalism be ethical? Well, look, um, I think you have to obviously the the purpose of you know both marketers, but obviously we're talking about advertisers here. You know, the advertiser's role as an advertiser is to create the best possible advert for their client. Okay, so that's their primary responsibility. But everyone, whatever role they particularly have in terms of their occupation, they also have general moral responsibilities as moral agents in the world that they can't just dismiss because they're pursuing some other particular role. So if you're a scientist, you know, your, your goal is to establish you know, reliable general truths about nature and the world, but you can't, in the pursuit of that truth, you know, forget about you know, the treatment of participants and the effect, potential effects of your discoveries on the world and so on and so forth. And similarly for advertisers, I mean, I don't think advertisers should be in a sort of mental space where they think, well, look, it's, it's capitalism, it's just what we have to do. I mean, they have to consider how is what I'm doing, how is this advert going to impact the people who it will affect, both case by case, the individual advert that you're working on, and as an industry as a whole. Because, you know, often in these cases, we were talking about an example before, so someone was complaining about an ad that, that, that portrayed a woman sort of preparing dinner for her children because you know, it's just this tired old stereotype, women prepare dinner. And yes, like when you look at it in an individual case, yes, it is sort of a ridiculous complaint that would never, never be upheld by the Advertising Standards Board. And, you know, I agree with that. But when you look at advert after advert after advert after advert, that, you know, just reinforces gender stereotypes, then there is a sense of frustration, and I think that's part of the problem with, with self-regulation approach, is it's very much a case-by-case case case basis, and it, there's no scope for sort of looking at the industry as a whole and what it's, what it's doing. We are, we are at a point of uh, a sort of crux in the advertising industry at the moment as well, what, where the, the media itself is, is changing more quickly than the, well, the, ad, the agencies can keep up with, let alone ethicists keep up with. Um, do you think we've got the capacity to, to sort of keep a watch on on uh, on the ethics of of for instance um, uh, things like well John this is an uh, example that you want to talk about search engine optimization which is a form of advertising or uh, digital uh, viral digital videos or pranks and things like that I mean do we have the capacity to sort of keep up with that ethically as it, as it moves so quickly I've been told by quite a few digital agencies that one of the great joys of working in digital is no laws mm. you can get away with a lot more uh, and you can you can you can, you know, and, and this will change. So I would say at the moment our laws are nowhere near keeping up with what's going on on that particular frontier. Likewise, tobacco is a really interesting area because we all believe that tobacco is, is, advertising is banned and yet there are at least three agencies in Australia who have tobacco clients, which makes you wonder what they're doing. There is a limited amount of stuff they can be doing. But um, as somebody said to me, uh, only partly facetiously, uh, tobacco advertising is like the R&D department for the rest of us because they have so many things they can't do. They've got to be out there pushing, trying to find every loophole, a loophole trying to find every new place you can go to. So I don't think the laws are anywhere near there. The reason, I, to go back just briefly to search engine optimisation, I think this is a, an area that no one's talking about. Most agencies, as far as I'm aware, are, are, particularly the digital ones, they all have a big part of their office that is the SEO team. Now, I, I would make the case, uh, and I'll concede that this is largely on hunches and, and lack of concrete evidence, that um, most people believe that Google is a utility. It's something we need, like electricity. We get up, we turn our internet on, we need a search engine that works. Well, it's a verb. So. It's, it's a verb. It's, it's a noun that became a verb, but it's, it, it has become a utility. It has become a resource for it. It's, it, it, is, it's not, it is a brand, but it's more than a brand. It's something... Uh, that, you know, in, in the old days you might have seen nationalised because it's something we use. But I do think it's questionable that the ad business is employing teams of people to corrupt Google. The, the whole idea of search engine op optimization is to get your brand higher in the listings that are returned when people put a search engine in. And I think there's a really solid ethical question over whether that's a good thing to do for any of us. Uh, but it's, it, oddly enough, I've been following this in the, in the trades for the last couple of years. I've never seen anybody raise that. It's just, it's, we can do it. It's out there to be done, so we will do it. And I think, so I think digital definitely is a place that needs to have a lot more discussion. Emma, are you um, 
keeping yeah, an eye on I, as a practitioner? Are you I, finding I it moving quickly? Can't believe what you can do online versus what the rules that govern us in terms of television and, and print, and to an extent radio online. It's just free for all. In fact, um, we could run a different television ad online if we wanted to. Uh, why do you? I mean, it, it's sort of crazy, isn't it? So, I mean, why do you think there has been such tardiness in, in regulating? I'm, I'm not sure. I wonder if it's just because, it, if this is a word, is it unpoliceable? <laughs> is it just such a massive network of communication? Surely, these and, companies must be able to be held accountable if they're yeah. Well, doing look, things that they again, should. I can only speak from Clemenger's perspective, but there's no way we would we would edit, cut and edit a different a different ad to go online. Again, you, you just do what's the responsible thing to do. Is and, and I don't think any of our brands would, would want to do that. Um, Some of it is unpoliceable, though. Yeah. And you go back yeah. to tobacco, there's great. I mean, there's, there's a, a, a Becky Freeman at the University of Sydney is doing some really good work. There's an awful lot of pro smoking videos on YouTube, and there's a lot of sort of fairly circumstantial evidence that they are being made by tobacco companies. Uh, there's uh, some, there's uh, some reasonable evidence that tobacco companies are. In, uh, are doing surveys online that are just harvesting exercises uh, because it is still legal if you're doing a survey or if you're doing a medical experiment to send people cigarettes and have them try them and then report back to us and tell us what you think. So there are all kinds of ways and yet they are very hard to pin down who's respond It's very hard to pin down who's making a comment in a chat room, mm -hmm. who's, who's, who's saying, actually, no, cigarettes are great mm -hmm. in the middle of some, in something else. It's very hard to actually be definite about where those things have come from. And I mean, just the fact that online or you get to a questionable site and as long as you say that, yes, I'm 18, all you're clicking is a button, then you're in and you can see whatever you want, so. Yeah, I think, I mean, in terms of advertising to children, obviously the online age has really brought a number of problems. I mean, we look at, as I have it, the, the, the sort of literature on the ethics of advertising to children, you know, almost all the research is based on you know, how children respond to television advertising, for example. So, you know, but which is obviously no longer the majority of advertising to children. And, you know, there are questions of, well, we know that, you know, children around the age of five or six can recognise a TV ad, but, you know, what about online content where basically there's, you know, at, you know, three quarters of advertising is really sort of merged with the information within the website. It's, there's this issue of disclosure. Children aren't necessarily aware that they're being marketed to. I even spoke to a mother of one of the children at... Uh, at the school my, my children attended and she talked about how her daughter spent a lot of time on the Barbie website, you know, playing games and things and, and I said, oh, well, you know, doesn't the advertising, you know, ask, make her ask for lots of Barbie products because oh, there's no advertising. <laughs> so when you've got grown-ups sort of not quite being savvy about what's going on, you sort of have to wonder about the six-year-old who's, who's mm -hmm. on the site there, so... Well, let's talk about advertising to children. Um, you know, Cordelia, should, should we advertise to children? Well, the, 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 the arguments that are made in, in favour of, of children being fair targets for argue, arguing is to say, well, look, once children uh, have persuasion knowledge, so once they can recognise advertising, they understand that its purpose is to sell and to persuade, and they can use that information to sort of sceptically evaluate the information they're being provided, well then they are, like us, fair targets. So sort of prior to that age, it's a bit like stealth marketing. So if I was to sort of wander about this room, you know, incognito and say, oh, gosh, I'm reading this wonderful book called A Mind of Its Own. It's so funny. It's the most insightful book about social psychology that I've ever read in my life. But I don't disclose to you that, you know, I'm actually Cordelia Fine and I want you to buy my product. Then, you know, They've seen you now. You can't get away <laughs> with it. I know. It can't be late. done. But, you know. I've read it, though. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you later. Um, OK, so, so that's sort of the... Most people can see that there's something rather unethical about that because you can't sceptically evaluate what I'm telling you about the product because you don't realise that I'm not just sort of some person giving you information. I have a, a sort of vested in interest in trying to persuade you that it's a good product. Now, now I say most probably people in the room can realise that. There are obviously some marketers who haven't quite made that ethical judgement because actually stealth marketing does, you know, does take place and it's somewhat controversial and I think it's unethical. But the idea is that once children are no longer sort of these naive people who think that marketers are just kind people giving them information about products and it's okay to market to them. I mean, I think the problem with this is that it's, first of all, 
I reviewed all, uh, all this data with Agnes Nairn, and we, there's this assumption that when children are more marketing savvy, when they're older, when they understand marketing, they will be less influenced by it. This proves, in study after study, not to be the case. Older children, children who have a greater, more sophisticated understanding of the purposes of marketing, are just as influenced by marketing as younger, more naive children. You ask us, well, this seems very counterintuitive. Why is this? Well, it kind of makes sense when you think about how children are marketed too. So they're not being presented with information like this. Here, here's a toy and you'll probably play with it for about a week and then you'll get bored with it and it's made of plastic and it might break. You know, it's, it's something fun, it's fabulous, it's exciting. It's basically evaluative conditioning. You're sort of creating a positive feeling towards the brand. There isn't sort of factual information that the child can then skeptically evaluate using all their sort of marketing savvy and marketing knowledge. So I think there's a real, the whole framework around the debate about ethics of the ethics of marketing to children is based on this sort of false premise that marketing works by sort of persuading you at this sort of conscious rational level, which once you have the sort of cognitive sophistication to sort of deal with, then you're a fair target. But this is not how marketing works. It's not how marketing works to children. And those, that persuasion knowledge isn't actually protecting them as, as consumers. So I think there's a uh, this is actually a real need to completely revisit the debate about the ethics of marketing to children. Could you not say much of that about adults? Well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, a, a lot of the data that you look at in terms of how, you know, evaluative conditioning, so basically pairing a product with some sort of, you know, positive stimulus, um, influences your feelings or behaviour towards the brand in a sort of non-rational way. And I mean, all that research is done on adults and it's kind of makes fools of us, basically, when you look at the results. Sort of, these people have no idea how they're being influenced by this sort of, these simulations of marketing. But I would say that when you look at the sort of what we've learned from cognitive science about how we can control for those kinds of influences, adults have much more of a capacity, if they're aware of it, of how they might be being influenced to actually control for those influences. I think children up to the, um, well, it's hard, it's hard to say, but, you know, this, this, this um, capacity to control for unwanted influences develops, you know, it's, it's a hallmark of, of maturity, it, it develops. But I think that, I think there's a, the, the research, certainly in the academic literature, I don't know about the sort of industry research, really until recently has talked very much about uh, advertising as targeting the conscious rational consumer, so trying to, you know, persuade consciously to, to to increase recall of the brand and so on and so forth and to, to change uh, conscious attitudes towards the brand. But when you look at uh, the research that's coming out now in psychology, it's, a lot of it's to do with, well, what about advertising that you might not even notice, might not remember, but it still can influence you at a sort of unconscious level, can still influence your behaviour. And I think if marketers or advertisers start to try and sort of exploit this aspect of way our, the way our minds work, sort of deliberately try and bypass our conscious sort of rational capacities, then that really will, will raise ethical haven't, haven't, concerns. Haven't that sort of always, that's been experimented with over the years? I mean, the, there's been the, that view that advertising does have this sort of black art about it, you know, subliminal oh. advertising, things from the, from the 50s that were kind of more like mind experiments than ads that we, we know today, isn't it? Good to hear Emma's view on this, but I don't think advertising goes for rationality that much at all. I think rationally, we don't need most things that are advertised. Um, uh, I, I, I've, yeah, I've had no problems with the things that are advertised, but rationally, we don't need them. Um, uh, to my mind, most, most the uh, advertising is dominated by emotion. It's dominated by appealing to emotions, mm. uh, not, not, not by dealing to uh, logical thought. Logically, nobody needs an iPhone. Uh, but, but by God, you know, I think I, people, and Apple, you, Apple is the great, sorry, I'll just call it, let me say, Apple, Apple to me is one of the great brand stories of our time because Apple is a cult. Apple is way beyond products. It's way beyond common sense. Uh, Apple is, uh, you know, Kevin Roberts' idea of the greatest thing you can have is a love mark, loyalty beyond reason. That is Apple to a T. Uh, and Apple is, Apple, you know, we talk about how defenceless kids are. It appears to me that adults are just massively defenceless to Apple. <laughs> Uh, we're buying, you know, the, this whole notion that, that we construct our identities out of, out of brands, or many of us construct large parts of our, our identities out of brands. Apple people are constructing major planks of their identities out of, out of brands. Don't walk through an advertising agency uh, if, you don't, <laughs> if you don't want to see an iPhone. Well, I, I'm, I'm having a really, just personally, because I'm, I'm, I'm a contrarian by nature, I'm going through a phase just for a few, I'm resisting Apple. Uh, and I'm just refusing to go with Apple, partly because I think I don't like the way they market. 
partly because I actually think they're every bit as much of a bastard company as Microsoft was. I think they're behaving appallingly as a corporate right now. Uh, but what interests me is less that and more that um, I'm receiving a latent kind of hostility from people around me that I don't like Apple. <laughs> uh. Well, bringing it, bringing it back to, to your quest, the question that you started to post to Emma. Mm, I am. Um, how rational are you when you when you appeal to people? I, I agree. I mean, advertising can't. We can't make someone buy something that they don't need. We just can't. All our job is there to help you perceive, I guess, that something, product A has more value than product B. And, I don't know, if you think about cornflakes, if you love cornflakes, there's cornflake A and there's cornflake B, and our job is to make you think that this packet of cornflakes is better than that one. But if you don't like cornflakes, then you're not listening. But and is that rational or emotional, though? What, what tool are you going to use to make us like one, one cornflakes more than others? Oh, look, I think if it came down to a health message, I suppose it would be rational, but I, I think nine times out of ten it's emotional. Yeah. But if you ask people why they choose a particular brand or why they use an iPhone, they're not going to say it's just some irrational, emotional urge that's been implanted with me by advertising. They're going to say, well, it's fabulous for, you know... That, that's one of the things somebody said, to, I love this thought, that, that most advertising is actually post-rationalisation. Uh, a lot of advertising is actually post-rationalisation. It's actually about, they give you reasons, particularly in car ads and big big purchases like that, they give you reasons to buy things so that after you've bought it, you'll feel good. After you've bought it, you can say, well, I did it because it's got, you know, ESP, whatever that means. <laughs> Nobody knows what half those terms in car ads mean, but they give us things, they give us terms. So how do you feel, feel about better. that, ethically? Uh, personally, I, you know, I'm kind of, well, I don't feel great about it, but I don't, uh, I accept that, the, what you were talking about before about kids, I think it's really interesting. Me, I don't think there should be advertising to kids. I just think it should not, I mean, certainly before eight, just not at all, mm. not at all. Uh, and I'm not really happy with um, much that goes beyond that, uh, right, right through the teenage years either. But having said that, one of the things I find interesting about the debate around, say, um, obesity and junk food advertising is they always talk about, well, wouldn't it be great if we could get McDonald's ads out of, the t out of advertising to kids? Okay. Now, last I saw, 82% of children's TV consumption was not in children's TV hours. So I do wonder, on, on one level, how much of, uh, how much, if, if you focus on, on just getting stuff out of kids', kids hours, if you focus on just getting kids out of ads, are kids still going to be influenced by the 82% of advertising they see, even if it's aimed at adults? If McDonald's only aimed at adults, would kids still be affected by it? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure they will, but there's also a difference between, you know, a, a, an advert that's designed to attract the attention and the appeal of children and one that's designed to, you know, appeal to, to adults. So, you know, there are issues in terms of junk food advertising that's, you know, very clearly designed to grab the attention of, of children. So, mm. I, I mean, I, I haven't worked on a on a brand that advertises to children, so I can't speak from experience either, but I was just checking through the AANA code of ethics today about advertising to children because I knew that this would come up and it's actually, um, you can't advertise food or beverage to kids under 12. So, and there was a lot of under 12 you couldn't, you couldn't do unless obviously it's healthy choice. Um, you can't use personalities, you can't use television characters or cartoon characters, you can't use... That was only, you know, there was a lot placement. of protest about that. I mean, that happened because... Yeah, and which, it's just a self-regulation as well, presumably. Has this is a volunt voluntary code, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I believe so. Yep. People don't well, have to. The companies don't have to do this if they don't choose well, no, to. But, but there was a lot of, you know, people hated it. Parents hated it. If you don't abide by it, you run the risk of the ad being pulled off air and and the damage that I guess that does to the relationship to the brand. But I mean, I also think I don't know whether this is a controversial thing to say or not. But I think if you've got a kid who's six going, I want that. You know, a lot of it, I think, lays with the parents to just say no. Well, I think that's very unfair to, 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 to be, as an advertiser, devoting so much talent and energy and money to trying to evoke desires for unhealthy products, you know, either physically unhealthy or psychologically unhealthy, in children, and then lay all the responsibility on parents to then, you know, to, to not capitulate to that, that child's desire and have the answering argument. I'm speaking as, argument. A, as yeah. a new parent who's never worked yeah. on advertising to children and I, I can imagine it's going to be impossible for my daughter, who's only one, but as she grows, to not be affected by messages that she sees and 
ask for things. I mean, it's just children's natures in supermarkets too, to just be attracted by colours and products and lollies. And there are lolly-free aisles and there are all those things now. But I guess for me, on a very simple level, if I start to start to say no, I, that's the beginning. I personally, I think of of just um, I think showing to her that you know from a very young age, I, it's this whole idea of pester power, I guess, and I, I query how powerful children are at getting what they want from what they see. But you know, does that fall down? <laughs> does that fall down? Anyone with a child over one been to that? <laughs> What's it? Uh, well, I am new at yes, this at yeah, parenting. No, no. <laughs> Yeah. So, do you think though that sometimes um, advertising can be a whipping boy in these public debates? Well, look, I, I think um, I think it's important for advertisers not to sort of try and shift the blame onto other people. I mean, certainly, when whenever the sorts of issues that you're talking about, whether it's you know childhood obesity, whether it's you know sexualisation of culture and children generally, of course there are going to be many people who have responsibility and you know it's not just advertisers, it's going to be, you know, in the case of sexualization, it's going to be yes, it's going to be music videos and it's going to be pornography and it's going to be shows and it's going to be um, you know magazines and you know and, and it's going to be to do, you know, parents have responsibility as well, of course. But I don't think that's any reason I think people who do target these issues don't just they don't think they see advertisers as a whipping boy. They just see it as part of something that is contributing to a problem. I don't think, I wouldn't necessarily say that they would, they would see advertisers as sort of the, you know, the scape, scapegoat for these, what they recognise as being complex issues. Because sometimes I feel that governments want to simplify it. And they, the, the, the lobbyists are well-meaning well and they, they, the lobbyists see the complexity of the, interview, of, the, of the issues, but by the time they get to government, I sometimes think they want to just be able to say, junk food kids, right? They want to be able to say, well, it's advertising that's the problem. And it's not. It's nine things that are a problem, one of which is advertising. Mm -hmm. And I think they're all very serious. But sometimes I get the sense that governments say, well, let's just actually change, the, change that one thing, and then we can go, job done. Much as they have done over the years with things like web filtering, if we could just get a filter in, that would be job done. And in fact, you know, from my perspective on the web filtering issue, education has been the answer from you know, 15, 20 years ago. They just refused to deal with that. Well, you talk about education, John. Part of the, uh, the thing that the uh, television show that you're responsible for, The Gruen Transfer, it, it educates people, I guess, about the, the tricks and the, uh, the, the thinking behind advertising. Is that something that you think is important, that people are, are armed and, and knowledgeable about the industry? Uh, we started, the show, Andrew Denton and I started the show with the idea that it would, in the best possible world, we would come up with something that gave people a Swiss Army knife. Kind of like Frontline did. What we, what we, we really looked at and said, well, Frontline gave people a set of tools with which to understand current affairs media. And we want to make a very entertaining show, but we also hope there's a Trojan horse element where we get some real information into the show to allow people to better understand it. I've always, and, and so, yeah, I, I think it's really important that people have better tools to understand an industry that is, has a $500 billion global turnover, that has an extraordinary uh, weaponry of art, science, creativity, um, cutting-edge technology. Uh, you know, the production values of most ads you see on TV are much better than the production values of the shows that they're in because they have, per second they have so much more money spent on them. Uh, this is an industry that is, 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 is uh, desperately, constantly trying to get our attention and we don't talk about it. So I do think it's, it's really it's useful and important for, uh, for, people, for people to have some, some tools to, to start taking it apart. Now whether we do that enough on the show uh, or to people's satisfaction, that's, a, that's another issue because we have this, this, the other twin master of trying to make entertainment. Emma, would you rather that people have the tools or not have the tools? Oh, definitely. I think, again, that means we're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, I suppose. And in terms of tricks, I think um, you were talking about mind influencing. Yeah, or, yeah that would be awesome <laughs> if you could do that. But um, it's probably more, you know, there's a lot of interest around special effects and how we put, you know, cold beads on beer and how food's created under lights and all that sort of stuff, I suppose. That, that is really interesting. Well, you talk about production values, John. Mm. I mean, the, the pack shot is the most expensive, time-consuming part of an ad. You can. I would say, actually, something that both um, um, Russell How Howcroft and Todd Sampson have said to me over the three years of Gruen is, because uh, people often say to them, why are you talking? Why are you saying how you go about things? You know, aren't they trade secrets that you're supposedly giving up? And they have both said independently, I think this is actually quite admirable, they both said, you know what, 
if we end up with a much more savvy public, the worst thing that can happen is that they'll hold us to a higher standard and we'll get rid of the percentage of advertising companies that are just crap. Mm. But there's also, I think, a, 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 there's an interesting question as to whether the, the, the sort of genuine and you know, really interesting knowledge that you get from the Gruen transfer that I've personally found interesting, absolutely fascinating, does actually make people less influenced by the advertising. There's even a possibility that there's this kind of ironic rebound effect whereby people go, oh, well, now I know. I know, I know, I know the tricks of the trade now, so I'm impervious. And what you find over and over again in social psychology, when you look at the sort of way that people can be influenced by factors that they're not either consciously aware of or not aware of how they're influencing their, their feelings or their behaviour, is the people who are most confident that they are not being affected by these things show the most influence on their behaviour. So Diabolical, white, John, I can't believe it. White, white <laughs> middle-class, ed, university-educated folk who love to say advertising doesn't affect me. Oh, I'm above that. Advertising. And I always just say, let me come into your kitchen and open the cupboard. Or you know, let's let look in your pocket and I'll see your <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> yeah, let, me <laughs> let me look in your garage. <laughs> Tell me what your car says about you. Because it is true. And I, th I actually think that's, I think you're completely right. There is, I reckon there is, uh, there's a certain percentage of blowback. And, but there is also the same problem that exists in advertising to kids certainly exists to us in adults. We do construct bits of our identity out of brands. I mean, and, and if, if not out of brands, then out of the, altern the opposite to brands. So, um, indulge me for a second with a personal story. Most of my life I've worn Converse sneakers and I know the reason I wore Converse. I wore Converse because they're the anti-Nike. Nike are you know, a sweatshop corporate company that did everything wrong and I wanted to wear something that I thought gave me a little bit of retro cool probably if I'm going to be vain enough to admit that and wasn't Nike. So I had a great moment about five years ago when I discovered that Nike owned Converse. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's a little tiny bit of the dove links in that too. Another one of my favourites at the moment, and this, this always goes over really well. Again, coming back to us white middle class folk, green and black's chocolate, my God, we love that. You see that in a lot of people's houses and on their desks and in their cubicles. It's Cadbury. <laughs> They're buying it because it's fair trade and it's organic. And it's That's all not looking your bag, could you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also Cadbury. <laughs> It does taste better. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that's, <laughs> that's another argument. And I was not paid to say that. <laughs>